When it comes to water treatment in the UK, you'd be forgiven for thinking that you need thousands of pounds worth of laboratory equipment on site to do testing uh, and expensive filling machines and goodness knows what else. In reality, the vast majority of the time in the UK, you're fine filling with tap water. In fact, in many scenarios, you might be okay just reusing the water that's already in the system. Any system with chemicals in should be tested annually to check the levels and many manufacturers and chemical companies are moving towards that. If you're doing tests annually anyway, then you could remove a part of this by just not installing inhibitor and just do basic water quality management. This will reduce corrosion and reduce scale in your system. Water treatment can be even more simple than adding inhibitor and retesting every year. VDI 2035 is a standard written by the Association of German Engineers. VDI isn't a method to achieve lower corrosion levels. It's actually just parameters for you to try and achieve. Now there are other countries that have different parameters. You've got the ONORM H15951 from Austria and SWKI from Switzerland. Now these use exactly the same methods, it's just that the parameters are slightly different. The methods can't be copyrighted, that's just chemistry. Now all those abbreviations might make it sound very complicated, but it really isn't. Water treatment is just basic chemistry, and what you're learning today is chemistry. So as the running theme of Heat Geek, we're going to show you today that you don't need loads of expensive equipment, you don't need to be fooled by sales brochures, you just need some basic understanding of what's going on inside the system. There's two main reasons to look at water treatment in heating systems. The first is corrosion, as we all know, and the second, which is much less talked about, is the effect on heat transfer due to scaling. You might have heard me talk about this previously, but it's said that one millimeter of scale on the heat exchanger can reduce heat transfer by five to 10%. So what is scaling? Scaling is where? Scaling is where salts in the water bake onto heat exchangers. That could be a heat exchanger in a hot water cylinder, um, the, the element in your kettle, or a heat exchanger in a boiler. And the flame essentially plays against this surface, making this surface hot, and when the salts make contact, which are in the water, make contact with the surface, they solidify and create a thin layer of scale. And that scale creates an insulative layer that insulates the heat from going from the flame into the water. The simple way to test this is to compare your flue temperature when you do a flue gas analysis with the flow temperature from the boiler. The higher the flue temperature above the flow temperature, the more flue gas that's passing through the waterways without being absorbed into the water. So you know that the higher the flue temperature above the flow temperature, the more scale you potentially have on that heat exchanger. Bear in mind when doing this, you'll need to compare this against the same boiler earlier on in its life. Now there's two sources of scale. The first source is calcium and magnesium, which simply come in from your tap, otherwise known as lime scale. And when these come into a surface that's 60 degrees or above, they solidify. And that creates a scale exactly the same as you find inside your kettle if you live in a hard water area. And if you think about the sheer temperature of the gas flame, that's gonna be around about 900 to 1200 degrees Celsius. The actual flow temperature is kind of the average of all the different flow paths in the boiler. So that really hot surface is way above 60 degrees. Now the second source of scale is iron. This either comes in from your mains, particularly if you've got old iron pipe work, or, and more likely, it comes off the radiators in the form of corrosion. And as it comes off the radiators, it enters the boiler, finds this hot surface, and solidifies, creating this insulative layer. Notably, VDI also covers hot water production for this very same reason. So where you have fresh mains water coming into your cylinder or combination boiler, and it's heated up in the coil or in the plate heat exchanger, this will also have this same scaling effect, reducing efficiency and meaning that you need higher temperatures in the boiler to have the same recovery rate or flow rates. Next, and most commonly discussed, is corrosion. We can never stop corrosion, only ever slow it. And the way we do that in heating systems is to make the system water as non-corrosive as possible. There are two main reasons for corrosion in heating systems. The first is that you have the incorrect pH of the water for the specific metals within the system. And the second is from electrolytic or galvanic corrosion. You might remember an experiment in school where you place two different types of metal in an electrolyte or conductive water solution. And as an electrical current passed, one metal would corrode in favor of the more noble metal. 
This can only happen if the liquid they're in is conductive. If the liquid is not conductive, this process can't happen. And contrary to popular belief, water, or pure water, is not conductive. Okay, so here I've got a, um, here I've got a beaker of RO water. So it's just come out the RO unit. Uh, the RO unit's quite old, it needs the cartridge change, but it's still 60 microsiemens, which is very low conductivity. And the tap water here is like 600. So um, if I create this little torch here with a battery, an LED. So if I put this in here, you can see that the light's not lighting up. The conductivity is not high enough. However, I'll just add a little soup on. A little soup on of salt in there. Bit more, actually, that's your more, yeah. You've got teaspoon. There's no kind of added to the end. Put it. Give it a little stir. Now we should immediately see that we've blown the bulb. <laughs> it immediately blew the bulb. So we, we tested this earlier and it worked perfectly well. The other battery. Oh. The other battery. But now that bulb's gone. So um, we just blew the bulb. Uh, the volt, this is a nine volt battery, it's too much. So um, we've got, uh, this will be about four and a half volts because it's in series, uh, 1.5 each battery. Um, I've got another little LED here. It's not all excitement and heat kick towers, you know. Until I had some beers last night. It's shaking hands. How many? None actually, I had some red wine. Just sheer refusal to use the tools that we've got. Absolutely. Make it easier. So. Is that the one that didn't work? Yeah, that's blown. You can see it. Ready? Ready. Way. Well, let's see if we can see any of the fizzing from electrons. It's not high enough voltage, really. Oh, there's a little bit of bubbling. You can see some bubbling on the negative terminal there, where the oxygen and the hydrogen are actually separating. But uh, it was happening a lot more when we had a 9 volt battery. Anyway, you get the idea. If you have pure water, there's no salts or anything in it or metals to conduct the electrons. Therefore, it doesn't conduct and you minimise galvanic corrosion. So the higher the level of salts and metals within our system water, the higher the conductivity of our water. And the higher the conductivity of our water, the higher the rate of corrosion. It's for this reason we measure the conductivity of our water. And that is measured in what's called micro siemens. It's a little U sign, back to front U sign with an S. VDI suggests that our water, our fill water, is no more conductive than 1,500 micro siemens. The other prerequisite to galvanic corrosion is oxygen. Now, if you have a look at this graph from a lector, the higher the oxygen level in relation to conductivity, the higher the corrosion rate. If you either have just low oxygen or just low conductivity, you'll have minimal corrosion. The amount of O2 or oxygen in the system really depends on varying factors, but they're all driven by Henry's law. Henry's law dictates the higher system pressure and lower the system temperature, the higher the concentration of dissolved gases in that liquid. If we lower the pressure, the amount of dissolved air within that water reduces. And if we increase the temperature, the amount of dissolved air in that liquid reduces. Dissolved air is a funny thing. When it's dissolved into a liquid, it holds no volume. So the liquid doesn't expand at all. It kind of fits in amongst the other molecules. However, when it comes out of the solution, it does begin to hold volume. This is shown in fizzy drinks. When they're carbonated, they're held at high pressure. And when they're held at this high pressure with carbon dioxide, they absorb the carbon dioxide. When you then unscrew the lid later on, you'll see that all of a sudden it holds volume. And then if you leave it sitting on the side, you'll see bubbles slowly coming out of solution as a liquid returns to an equalized state for that pressure and temperature. And when it's equalized, you'll know because it will be flat. And likewise, you'll notice if you've ever put a pan on the boil to boil up some eggs or something, as it warms up, you'll see some little bubbles forming around the imperfections around the surface and the edge. This is where the water is becoming at a saturated of air state and it's trying to eject the bubbles. 
If you then take that pan back off the heat, you'll see it will reabsorb those bubbles because the water is in a lower state. So it will actually be actively trying to draw air in from the air into the water in a process called diffusion. Unfortunately, testing oxygen within systems is very difficult and expensive. The main reason being is as soon as you take the water out of the system, it's in contact with the surrounding air and your reading will become inaccurate. VDI suggests that sealed systems will settle at 0.02 milligrams per litre if they're correctly installed and maintained. So that means using barrier pipe and obviously sealing the system up. And as such, VDI is fine for good quality sealed systems to be up to 1,500 microsiemens. You'll notice that 0.02 milligrams of oxygen per litre is right at the bottom of this graph. So VDI are happy to have a conductivity up to 1,500 microsiemens, but obviously the lower the better. So you may have noticed on older non-barrier plastic pipes with no inhibitor, higher corrosion rates. That's because of this process of diffusion. If you don't use materials with proper barriers to oxygen, the air will permeate these surfaces and get into the water and raise the O2 content. And all materials are susceptible to this, just in very varying amounts. Mains water naturally has a very high oxygen content because A, it's high in pressure, especially from where it's pumped at the main pumping stations, and B, it's cooler. So injecting that into a heating system is immediately putting high oxygen concentration into your heating system. Much of this oxygen is going to come out of solution during the initial heat up though and be vented off during commissioning. And after this process, the system would have equalised its oxygen content relative to its pressure and temperature. The remaining oxygen in the system will attack the metals within the system. However, this process can actually be quite handy. As fresh metals appear in the system and the oxygen attacks them, they create what's called a passive layer. And that's just where the very top surface corrodes and creates a thin insulative barrier preventing penetration of fresh or new oxygen to deeper down layers and slowing the corrosion process. The remaining oxygen will then be largely used up attacking different metals. This puts the water in a lower state, meaning it's more likely to try and hold on to that oxygen and not lose it to other metals within the system. However, this passive layer will only stay in place if the system water pH is correct. So most of you are probably already aware of what pH is, but for those that aren't, the pH of a liquid is how alkaline or acidic that liquid is. Traditionally, you would have tested this with litmus paper. If the pH of the system water is too much in either direction, it will dissolve this passive layer and expose fresh pipe underneath for the oxygen to corrode, and simultaneously release this corrosion into the water, raising the conductivity. A pH of 7 is neutral, Below seven is acidic and above seven is alkaline. We can see here that the ideal pH for copper is around about nine. And the iron in our radiators is happy with a pH of around about 10. Now there are a few different types of metals in systems. So VDI suggests to look for a pH of between 8.2 and 10, if you don't have aluminium in the system. If the system contains aluminium, that's lowered to 8.2 to 8.5. However, it's also worth checking the manufacturer's instructions. For example, some Worcester Bosch instructions stipulate that pH must be below eight, otherwise the manufacturer's warranty is invalidated. This is a bit of a double-edged sword, as the lower pH won't be ideal if you have steel radiators. However, they do also advise you to use inhibitor. If you're still soldering systems, one of our theories is one of the main causes of corrosion is flux being left in the system, which increases the acidity of the water in the system. So rounding things up so far, here's the basic things that you need to check with your system fill water. One, the conductivity of your system water must be below 1,500 microsiemens. This means that the vast majority of tap water in the UK is just fine. The conductivity of the tap water around our area is between sort of 400 and 800, so well below the 1500. If your tap water is above 1500 microsiemens, you will need to use a demineralization filling unit in order to comply with VDI, even if that's a partial blend of slightly filtered water and topped up with 
typical tap water. Once you've tested your tap water and your neighbour's tap water, you'll typically find it will always sit within a certain range. So it isn't necessary to do all the time. However, it is necessary to retest once you've filled your heating system, as you can pick up bits of sort of corrosion and whatnot from inside the system, which will lift the conductivity. It's also worth noting, if you're doing a sort of boiler swap or something like that, if you measure your conductivity, you might find out that the system water in the system you're about to drain down is very good due to the fact that all the scale has been cooked out of the system already on the old heat exchanger. This leaves pretty good water to fill your heating system with, provided it's clean obviously. So measure your conductivity, if it's nice and low and lower than your tap water, it might be worth just reusing that. And in the longer term this will need retesting. Because if you do get any corrosion, obviously the iron ends up in the water, raising the conductivity, and it ends up in this vicious uh, feedback loop. Two, the pH. It's not always necessarily worth testing the tap water's pH, as this should always be between 7.2 and 7.4-ish. Outside these pHs, it begins to leave the definition of potable water, which your water company must provide. As previously described though, we're really aiming for a pH of 8.2 and above. However, the pH of system water naturally rises over time. This is where, in the Henry's Law that we mentioned earlier on, the water's heated up and it ejects CO2 out of the water. Now CO2 is slightly acidic, hence why CO2 creates acid rain. As we heat up the water and the CO2 leaves, we'll naturally get a climbing in the pH water within the system. This is called self-alkalinization. As the system water is heated up throughout the year for heating and hot water, the pH will slowly climb as the CO2 is ejected out of the water, creating a lower state within the water. It should settle round about 8.1 to sort of 8.4. Uh, if you want a slightly higher pH than that, you can pick up some pH plus tablets from any pool company or Amazon. Three, the level of scale. The maximum permissible level of scale within a system, according to VDI, depends on the system volume. Now, typical domestic systems in the UK vary between 70 litres and 100 litres. If we assume a 10 kilowatt system has that amount, that would be around about seven to ten litres per kilowatt for that system. If you have a look at the graph, you'll see that any system below 50 kilowatts and below 20 litres per kilowatt would have a maximum level of scale of three mole per metres cubed. That's equivalent of 300 parts per million. Hard water areas in the UK are typically between 200 and 300 parts per million. So if you're in a hard water area, you're fine to fill with tap water. However, if you're in a very hard water area, which is 300 parts per million and up, you might have to demineralize to bring your scale levels down to acceptable levels and also probably reduce your conductivity. Have a look at this map. You can see how common it is to have very hard water. However, I'd still really advise testing this locally or contacting your water supplier as these maps aren't always accurate and it does change throughout the year. Even with full underfloor heating, most systems will still be under 20 litres per kilowatt. For example, 500 metres of underfloor heating tube has around about 60 litres in it. So you could tell if that will do a large ground floor, maybe another 500 for a second floor, you're still at only 120 litres volume. Please note, this is also assumed on a complete three fills of the system throughout its lifetime. So every time you fill up that whole system, you put in scale, you'll bake scale onto the heat exchanger. If you then drain that system down and completely refill it, you need to bake all that new scale in that water onto the heat exchanger, building up the layers as you go along. This will potentially lead to overheating and lack of heat at the radiators later on, or just loss of efficiency, which you will never know. If you do have system fill water that you've measured above 300 parts per million, you may decide to use a softener to fill the heating system. Now that is fine, but you should be aware that these can increase the conductivity uh, and you need to be careful that you don't allow it to go above 1,500 microsiemens. However, demineralization units don't work the same way as softeners. Demineralization units take out all of the minerals or as many as possible out of the water, giving you up to zero parts per million or up to zero microsiemens. And lastly, oxygen. As previously stated, VDI suggests that most sealed systems will settle around 0.02 milligrams per litre. However, if you've got an open vent system or non-barrier pipe in your system, then it can be assumed that this is going to be exceeded. In which case, you need to bring your, the conductivity of your water right down. VDI suggests you bring this down to below 100 
micro siemens for doing this you will absolutely need a demineralization unit of some description but please be aware also that you don't want to end up with a system ideally below 80 micro siemens the reason for this is because all the salts are removed from the water there's less body to the water so the ph can just wander off in any direction quite easily there's nothing stabilizing it so again, a quick roundup. One, make sure your conductivity is below 1500 microsiemens for sealed systems and below 100 microsiemens for open vent systems and systems with air ingress potential. Two, the pH should be above 8.2. Beware of filling aluminium systems with softened water. The different makeup of the water can mean the self alkalization process settles above 10, which is not healthy for aluminium systems. Remember, systems with aluminium should be between 8.2 and 8.5 to comply with VDI. Three, in most domestic systems, the scale level should be below 300 parts per million. Four, as previously stated, VDI suggests that most sealed systems will settle around 0.02 milligrams per litre. So what kit do you really need? As with all our videos, our angle on this is that you don't need to spend thousands of pounds on equipment, although we did. So, we got this piece of equipment here, which is just uh, a testing kit. Um, I have no idea how much was paid for at the time. Um, this is really good, but I don't really think that you need it necessarily for uh, domestic, and I'll come on to that in a bit. You've got pH tester, uh, conductivity tester, and then different tests for testing hardness, um, uh, uh, among many other things, uh, which we'll go on to probably in another video later on. Uh, so there's that kit. That's probably a little bit over the top for most systems. We bought this Prime Lab kit. This was about 1500 quid at the time or so. Um, this does the same as the last kit, uh, except for it does it to a much higher sort of accuracy. Um, and, and there are more parameters available. So that's the Prime Lab kit. This is proper high end, good stuff. Um, more for commercial, in, in my opinion. Uh, again, more on, that, more on that in a bit. This was my first softened filling unit I bought. Um, this is single bed resin, so uh, this will increase the conductivity. Um, I, I don't advise really getting these. This was the second. This was the second filling kit I used. Um, I got this about four or five years ago. Um, this is a reverse osmosis system. So essentially, all this is is a, a load of filters. Um, the problem with these are that you need good pressure, and even when you do have good pressure, the flow rate from these is very low. Uh, but it does get everything out. Um, in fact, we've just filled up some water now, uh, and that came out at 50 parts per million. No, sorry, that came out at 50 microsiemens. Um, although when I did first buy this, this was coming out at naught parts per million. I think this is well overdue a cartridge change by now though, so. But again as well, uh, you can just partially fill with this to get your conductivity down and then top, top up the tap water. And then more recently, we've been filling, um, so we installed the hydrogen fuel cell, uh, Wiesmann hydrogen fuel cell systems, and we fill with this uh, that we got from Wiesmann. I'm not sure who makes this. This is just to fill the buffer. Um, this is made by HWE. Uh, it's twin bed resin though, so um, you get uh, naught parts per million out the other end. Uh, relatively slow, but um, works fine. I think it's about 400 quid though, and you only get about something like four fills or something along those lines. So uh, that's what we've been using more recently. So like I say, you can use these kits to measure all sorts of things. You can measure uh, the iron concentration, the inhibitor concentration, and all these things are interesting. You can find out why your corrosion happened. However, in typical domestic systems, the result is always the same. You're going to drain out the water and refill with fresh water, typically tap in most circumstances. So the original cause might be interesting and you may uh, do something slightly differently when you refill it. But for the majority of the times, all you really need out of all of this kit is an electrical conductivity meter, uh, which come from like 10 pounds upwards. However, the more you spend, the better they are. Um, uh, and, a, and a pH meter like this one here. Um, when you get a pH meter, you make, need to make sure it's got ATC. It's automatic um, uh, a temperature adjustment because um, uh, that can throw the pH reading out. Um, so really out of all of this kit, the main two things, or well, the only two things that I would definitely say that you need are these two bits of kit here. Um, 
All the other stuff isn't entirely necessary, perhaps if you're in a very hard water area. If you're doing commercial, however, you will want to absolutely find out what the cause is. You want to avoid downtime of the system. Uh, the system's going to be in used in offices and things where they're going to need to remain comfortable and you don't want to waste all that water in the system just by flushing it down the drain. In that situation, you are going to have to treat the water that's there to improve it over time. So that is when you would need all of this. However, for commercial, I would strongly advise leaving that to people who do that for a living, not having a go yourself as an amateur. But as I say, with domestic, typically you'll just flush the water away and refill with fresh water. The original cause isn't as necessary to spend time finding. So what does VDI say about using inhibitor? VDI says to fill with potable water and only use inhibitors in extreme circumstances where it's required and the engineer putting in the inhibitor should be appropriately trained in that chemical area. So this video will be supplementary to an article that will be on heat. Well, hold up guys, sorry. This was actually all recorded uh, 18 months, two years ago, and a hell of a lot has changed since. As you know, since then, we've been approached by Bayes to develop an online heating design course, uh, which is now available to purchase. But also, the government have now decided they are gonna fully back and push heat pumps, albeit while lowering the subsidies for installing them, which does make a bit of a difference when it comes to water treatment. See, because heat pumps require a much higher flow rate, four to three times faster than that of a gas boiler, the pipework to maintain the same velocity must be a lot bigger, therefore have a lot more volume. Additionally, sometimes, not all the time, heat pumps benefit from a buffer. Both of these things put together means there's a lot more volume per kilowatt of heat input. Oh, and additionally, heat pumps work better on underfloor heating. Again, more volume. So because of this, really, we're now gonna have to start looking at scale levels below 200 parts per million. And if you have a look at this map, you'll see that that's the vast majority of the UK. And the areas that do have hard water have much higher population. Also, low temperature heating systems have finally been kind of accepted and approved as a good idea. The issues with these is bacterial growth. And again, stripping out all the minerals by demineralizing removes all of the food that bacteria needs to survive. If you've got uh, 80 to 100 microsiemens floating around your system, there's not much breeding ground for bacteria there. So um, if we're gonna do low temperature systems, bacteria grows very quickly in low temperature. Uh, it gets cooked off if you're at high temperature. So low temperature systems do do better with demineralization. We've also opened up an online shop and there's a lot of very innovative products for water treatment on there. For example, this is the saw box. So the saw box is much like a filter um, that you put on a, uh, a normal heating system. So uh, the saw box looks like this. I think it's better the other way up. Yeah, this. Essentially, this is the saw box. So, so the saw box is much like a normal filter. Uh, two isolation valves either side. Actually, I'll take off the insulation so you can see as well. Uh, but it has a little bit more going on in the inside. It's quite a heavy bit of kit actually. This has a built-in stainless strainer or medium, as you might know from any de-aerator, uh, to catch micro bubbles uh, in the low velocity zone, which filter up to the air vent and get bled off at the top. So um, uh, de-aeration, but additionally to that, to uh, lower oxygen levels, it's got a built-in sacrificial anode, which literally eats up the oxygen in your system. It also has an ionic filter built in, which basically eats up any minerals in the system, lowering your scale right down to protect your heat exchanger, and importantly, lowering conductivity. And it'll bring your conductivity right, right down, which is obviously the other variable that you need to attack if you want to lower corrosion. And lastly, it has a big low velocity zone at the bottom uh, to collect anything that's non-metallic like nickel or, or brass or whatever is floating around the system that needs pulling out to lower conductivity. It does also have a big um, uh, uh, magnet in the bottom as well to pull out any uh, iron. So this is expensive, it's five or 600 quid, but this is for the high end stuff and this is, you know, fit it, forget, uh, it's all done for you. Also be aware that there's an SI, I think there's an SI version and an LI version. Um, the SI version does the de-aeration uh, and it's a filter, etc. The only thing it doesn't do, which the LI does do, is lower the scale um, so it hasn't got that ionic filter inside that eats up minerals. So that is relatively expensive, but so is the, you know, 
12, 15 grand worth of heat pump stuff you've just put in. And it's a do it all device. You just put it in and walk away. Probably flush it first. Maybe flush it first. <laughs> Next, we have the, probably aware of this one. Should I zoom out loads when you put it on the table? Nah. Or something. Pure tap leader. Essentially, um, this does all of that instantaneously. Uh, uh, and it just literally plugs into your sort of in line with your filling loop. So you turn up with this uh, piece of equipment and um, uh, fill via it and it will lower your conductivity to naught parts uh, per million and um, it will also instantly self alkalinize the water by removing the CO2. Unlike the store box, this stays in your van. You take it out to site, fill up via the filling loop and um, uh, chuck it back in. So this is a twin bed cartridge, so it removes all of the scale, uh, but also doesn't leave high conductivity water. It lowers the conductivity right down, down to naught parts per million. And that process also removes the CO2. So it comes out of the correct pH at the end because uh, it's self alkalinized uh, more rapidly. Um, and you'll end up with, I don't know, pH 8.2 to 8.4 or something like that. I'll take this out the box in the review we're gonna do. Um, so have a look for that. It's quite heavy. And we also have, domestically at least, PureTap Micro. PureTap Micro is uh, much cheaper than the other two. Essentially, a little hose that comes with it. Uh, essentially, you can either carry this around with you um, or screw it on the wall uh, and leave it hard pipe it, leave it in line so um, your customer can continue filling the system if it needs to be filled and it will uh, demineralize um, uh, the water. It won't reduce O2 or uh, self alkalinize but um, uh, the, the handy thing about this, what I really like, is if you see this sort of blue membrane here, this turns white as it loses its uh, ability to descale. So as it all uh, turns white, when it gets to the bottom, uh, the customer has contact you or get another one sent out so you can get them swapped over. Uh, so if you hard pipe this in line, um, you can walk away and they can fill up the system as much as they want. Depends kind of which route you want to go. Uh, this is much cheaper as well, so um, and kind of handy and easy to chuck on your van. It might actually be quite good on a commercial pressurisation unit as well. If they know they've got a little tiny leak, they pop one of those before the pressurisation unit. If you've got one of these on your van uh, and there's something like that and you can just go, rather than going through a whole process, you can go here's a quick fix that means things are just going to stop for the moment until we sort something you know um uh, more permanent in place it's just easy to carry around carry stock up a few and flog them as you go around so um yeah quite like that uh, well, again we'll do a review on it soon how much what am i to say right now patrick now you absolutely do not need all of this kit for every install unless you want to be the best <laughs> you want to be the best uh, but you absolutely do need the electric conductivity meter and the pH meter, EC meter and pH meter, uh, which again, you can get on our store because you will need those to find out if you do need these other products or not to comply with VDI. And if you're not complying with VDI, then you should be fitting inhibitor or something because you're not doing anything. Or you can carry on using inhibitor, but if you are using inhibitor, you need to be aware every time you chuck in a random bottle of inhibitor into your system, uh, eventually, well, straight away, you're increasing conductivity. Eventually the inhibitor dies because it eats the oxygen and it, it turns into a nothingness. It leaves high and, uh, a high concentration of um, old soup. And then you'll chuck in another bottle because you need to top up the um, inhibitor and that will eventually increase the conductivity more uh, and that inhibitor will die and you just end up with this corrosive soup. And this kind of soup also leaves a huge amount of food for bacterial growth which is one of the main causes of corrosion. Okay guys, that's it. Sorry it was a long one, but there was a lot to cover. Don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications so you get alerted on your phone every time one of these videos is out so you don't miss any. And I'll see you next time. Just to prove this doesn't work with pure water, because pure water doesn't conduct. It is lighting up a bit there. Is, that, is it not that one there, is it? That jar. Try both. No. Uh, you can see it's a lot less though. <laughs> and hey presto. <laughs> Fuck. Got the O-Norm H5195. One. He's back.
even though I've got added just a bit at the end. Put your finger in it. And at the end of the day, chemistry is chemistry. And what you're learning today is chemistry. <laughs> <laughs> you can say it was true. Ah! <laughs>